In this video, we are going to look at the concept of uh, what is called knot theory, and then we are going to look at its relation to quantum mechanics in physics. So uh, knot theory, which comes under the mathematical field of topology. So what you can do is you can say that one of the aspects of topology is this knot theory. And of course, then topology has many other aspects. So there could be uh, multiple uh, lines like this. Now, in this mathematical field of topology, knot theory is the study of mathematical knots. Now, what do we mean by a, a mathematical knot is that it is essentially the study of closed curves in a three-dimensional space, in R3. And of course, then we would be also studying uh, the deformations, the possible deformations of these closed curves, uh, such that one part does not uh, cut through another, right? So they pass over each other, uh, but they're not cutting each other. That's the definition of knots, right? It is inspired by uh, the knots which really uh, you encounter in your daily life. Uh, for example, uh, the knots that you see in a rope or your shoelaces. So over here, you can see uh, different types of knots. Uh, these are some of uh, the different types of knots. Uh, essentially, these are some of the prime uh, knots. Now, the first one over here, you can see it's called the unknot. And this is the most simplest of the knots, uh, sometimes also called uh, the trivial knot. And you can see that this is just a ring in mathematics, right? Next, what you can do is you can uh, give uh, these knots different names. For example, this one is called a trefoil uh, knot, right? Now, uh, you see that the, you see these different numbers over here. We'll come back uh, to this notation uh, in a bit. Uh, at the moment, just uh, look at this diagram to get an idea of what knots am I uh, talking about. Now, uh, let's see what do we mean uh, by when we say a mathematical knot. What is a mathematical knot? So you can say that a knot, let's call uh, a knot K, then a knot K is simply a closed curve, right? It's a simple, simple closed curve. What do we mean by that? Well, uh, we know in mathematics, a simple closed curve is a one that is nearly injective and a continuous function. Uh, how do you write that down mathematically? Is saying that this knot k is a injective and a continuous function such that uh, k takes 0 and 1 and it maps it to R3, space of three dimensions, where the only non-injectivity is uh, this one where k of 0 is equal to k of 1. Now, sometimes what can happen is you might have two knots that at least appear uh, that they are positioned quite differently, but however, they are uh, considered as the same knots. And that's where we uh, talk about the idea of what is called knot equivalence. So basically, the idea of knot equivalence is, again, to give a precise definition of when uh, two knots are to be considered exactly the same, even though that they are positioned uh, in different ways in space, right? So mathematically uh, speaking, two knots, suppose k1 and k2 are these uh, two knots, they are equivalent if there is an orientation preserving homomorphism, right? And what is that? That is h is from R3 to R3, such that H of not one is equal to not two. This would imply that the two knots are equivalent or they can be considered the same because you can see from this definition, there is indeed an orientation preserving homomorphism in there. So again, what this definition of knot equivalence means is that you have two knots and they are equivalent as long as there is a continuous family of homomorphisms of space onto itself, right? Such that uh, the last one of them carries the first knot onto the second knot. Now, uh, how can you uh, say mathematically, how can you find out uh, if two knots are equivalent? For that, there is something that is called a knot invariant, right? And these knot invariants can be computed in uh, different ways. Sometimes they can be even computed by the help of a knot diagram, which uh, the diagrams uh, I showed you over here, these are called the knot diagrams. You can compute these knot invariants for uh, each knot uh, from this knot diagram as well. And what that does is if you have, uh, if two knots have a same 
value for the knot invariant, that implies that the two knots are equivalent. Now we can have these knot invariants of uh, two types at least. Uh, the first one is the classical knot invariants, while the second one is, as you guessed it, quantum uh, knot polynomials or quantum knot invariants. Now classical knot invariants include uh, what is called the knot group as well. This is a fundamental group of the knot complement, right? And uh, then you can also talk about the Alexander polynomial, uh, which can be computed from what is called the Alexander invariant. Right. Now, next, this thing, uh, quantum knot polynomials, they were discovered in the late 20th century, right? And there are different types of invariants that were discovered. One of them is also called the hyperbolic invariants. And uh, then you also have, uh, if I pronounce that right, uh, Westleaf uh, invariants. I probably got the pronunciation wrong, uh, but you don't have to get into uh, the depths of these things, at least in this uh, video. Now, uh, I talked about a uh, quantum knot polynomial. Then the idea, uh, the question is that what is a knot polynomial? Again, very briefly uh, speaking, a knot polynomial is simply a knot invariant, which is a polynomial, right? And th there are multiple examples of these knot polynomials, such as the Jones polynomial, which we'll be talking about in this video when we're going to relate it to the quantum mechanics. And then we also have what is called the Alexander polynomials. Okay, now let's come back to uh, oh, these things, which are called the uh, knot diagrams and the these diagrams are labeled under alexander briggs notation so you have multiple uh, notations uh, in labeling these knot diagrams right tabulating these knots uh, one of them the most traditional notation at least is the alexander briggs notation uh, then you have other multiple notations as well such as the conway uh, notation uh, and the gauss code as well right but uh, let's talk about this alexander briggs notation as it is the most traditional notation as well uh, it was first uh, described in the 1927 paper of uh, James Alexander, right? And then it was later extended uh, by, uh, by other people as well. So the very basic idea of the Alexander Briggs notation is that it uh, organizes your knots by their crossing number. So in this one, well, there is no knots, right? So it's just called the unknot or a ring. Then you have this thing, three subscript one, right? You can see that there are three crossings, this one, this one, and this one. Right? So you see, that's why you have this three. Uh, the subscript one is to denote its order amongst all the other knots with the same crossing number. So you can see there is only one, uh, one of uh, this knot where you have three crossings. You can only have one of that. Then over here, you see that you have uh, four sub one. In this, again, four implies that there are four crossings. Let's see, one, two, three, four. So there are four crossings over here. And there is only, again, one type of that. Then you have five, one. So that means there are five crossings. And this is the first type. So you see one, two, three, four, and five, right? So there are five crossings and this is the first type. Then again, this is five, two, which means that again, there are five crossings, but this is the second type of that knot, right? So here again, you can see one, two, three, four, and five. There are five crossings. And similarly, you get the idea. You can check for all these others, uh, check the crossing number and its order amongst uh, the other knots with the same crossing number. All right, now let's uh, shift towards uh, quantum mechanics. So let's go towards quantum mechanics. Now, in quantum mechanics, a knot can be regarded as an orbit in space-time of a charged particle. So what I mean by that is, suppose you have uh, a starting point for a particle, let's call it I, and you have a final uh, point of that particle where it will land, finally, is let's call it F. Then you can have a trajectory or an orbit from I to F, uh, something like this, then this orbit uh, can be uh, regarded as a knot, or a knot can be regarded as this orbit in space-time. And uh, suppose that this is an electron that is uh, mo going or tracing this orbit, right? Now, a study of knots, it involves the idea of what we discussed before, uh, not really discussed, but mentioned at least before, uh, the Jones polynomial, right, in knot theory. Now. What we can do is, in fact, we can go and calculate this number that is Jones polynomial for any knot. And this number, Jones polynomial, which is J sub K for, uh, for any kth knot, if this number is not equal to 1, this implies that the uh, knot can never be untangled, right? So the knot can not be untangled. Again, this uh, J sub K is called the Jones polynomial. 
Okay, and this video is not uh, wait, uh, polynomial. So this video is not going to uh, go into uh, the depth of what is not theory and what is quantum mechanics. For uh, the detailed understanding of this, these two topics, it is a better idea to uh, read uh, books that are on not theory and have an understanding of quantum mechanics. Uh, this video is just essentially to give you an idea of if you already know what not theory is uh, or have basic concept or an idea of what not theory is and uh, have a very good understanding of quantum mechanics, then how can you bridge uh, the two, right? Bridge the gap between the two. So. Uh, coming back to this thing again, uh, if I have a particle, now suppose that I drew this path, right? Let's let's suppose that this was not an electron. Suppose it was any a classical particle. Now, a classical particle that is traveling from one point in space-time to another point can get there on a very neat orbit, which follows Newton's laws of motion. So over here, this is a very pretty neat orbit, as you can see, and this orbit or this uh, particle follows Newton's laws of motion. However, you know that, uh, well, first let me label this one as a classical path. Uh, but now, what about, the question is, what about quantum mechanics, right? What about the path that uh, a particle, a quantum particle is going to trace uh, in space-time? Now, we know that a quantum particle may take any possible path, right? And a fairly often path is quite irregular. So the path that is usually taken could be a little bit irregular, right? So what we do is we have uh, all possible paths with number of loops and zigzags in quantum theory. So for example, one uh, particular path, again, if I label this point as I and this point as F, the path may look something like this. So you can see here it has a lot of zigzags and it goes to F. Now, what I did is I clearly uh, intentionally drew this thing, which is a knot in the path, right? So you can see where I'm getting at. Uh, in the world of two space in one time dimension, which means that suppose if I have uh, two plus one dimensions, which is again two for space and one for time, the path of the particle might be knotted, right? So again, it could be, suppose this is I and this is F, then in uh, a two dimensional space, the path may look something like, so if I draw it correctly, uh, it could look something like this, Something like that, right? So you you, you almost uh, get the idea of, of what I mean by a knot. So so you can see that this path, the path of this particle is indeed uh, it is knotted, right? It, it, there are knots in this uh, path. So what we do is we sum over all the possible paths by which a particle reaches its destination, right? That is what we do in quantum mechanics when we are computing uh, the path integral. Uh, we sum over all the possible paths uh, to figure out uh, the probability amplitude of that uh, particular uh, start and end motion. Now, let's say that you have a particle that traveled on a particular path. So let's go create another page. Uh, suppose that you have uh, a path k, right? So I'm intentionally calling this path k as uh, k, it, the path would be a knot, right? Then there exists, there exists a probability, right? A probability amplitude for it to arrive at its destination. So probability amplitude to go from i to f, right? The initial point to the final point, which is its destination. Now, this amplitude that you're calculating uh, is going to depend on this path k, what the path is, and of how it depends on this path k is actually very important in uh, this uh, whole concept. In fact, uh, how it depends on the path, how the probability amplitude depends on the path is the reason why we have some order in quantum mechanics in quantum theory, which essentially means that all possible paths uh, are likely, but the most peculiar, uh, peculiar ones are not going to happen. They're not probable. Uh, the probability for the, the peculiar paths is uh, not very likely. So you can see uh, this connection that we have between the Jones polynomial, J sub K, and, uh, and uh, quantum mechanics, this is uh, the connection that we are looking for. And this connection can be made if we regard a naught k as the orbit in space-time of a charged particle. In that case, the Jones polynomial is just the average value of what is called uh, a Wilson operator, right? So again, uh, the, uh, the, the Wilson operator, let's call it W, uh, what is that? Uh, again, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but Simply speaking, it is just the trace 
of a path ordered exponential, right, uh, of a gauge field. So the gauge field here is a sub mu, uh, a mu, right? So it's a it's a four vector uh, of dx mu. Now, again, what do we mean by that, right? So the integral is carried out over dx mu, but this integral implies that this gauge field a mu is transported along some curve c, right? So along a curve c. So that is how your Wilson operator is defined. And again, the Jones polynomial j sub k is just the average value, the expectation value of this Wilson operator, right? So uh, this, again, is the quantum formula for uh, Jones polynomial, this thing, uh, which is the expectation value of the uh, Wilson operator. So this is then the quantum uh, expression or a formula. Now, we know that in everyday life, a knot is just a physical uh, object that exists in space. But as we saw, to even have an idea of the Jones polynomial, one views a knot as a path in space-time of two plus one dimensions. Right? So, so far, I've been talking about uh, two plus one dimensions. Right? So that is just uh, two space and one time dimensions. How about if I want to extend it uh, to uh, three plus one dimensions or four dimensional space-time? I can do that by using what is called uh, the Hovenoff homology. Right? Now, the, the Hovenoff homology uh, of a knot K, so the Hovenoff homology of some knot K is the space of space of quantum states that can be labeled by H sub K. Right? So that is, uh, uh, very briefly speaking, that is what Hovenoff homology is. But the idea of Hovenoff homology or the advantage of Hovenoff homology is that it involves these four dimensions. Right? And then the ideas of uh, what we have been discussing so far, they are even closer to uh, the particle physics concept uh, than uh, that of the Jones polynomial. So you can see, as uh, one would have initially thought, that this whole concept of knots uh, in mathematics, how can it be really useful, uh, especially in, uh, in physics of subatomic particles or quantum mechanics? But it turns out we can see this beautiful relation between uh, the two uh, topology connecting with quantum mechanics. Uh, more uh, concretely speaking, uh, knot theory uh, can be related to quantum mechanics. And it's almost a very uh, beautiful encounter of uh, these two very different uh, fields, right? Knot theory and quantum mechanics. But you can see uh, that by understanding, by looking at a path of a quantum mechanical particle, it it seems as though the two uh, uh, the two theories, that the knot theory and the quantum theory, were made for each other. 